read just a few verses. This is the last message now on the subject of fellowship. I wanted plenty of time this morning because of the nature of this message. It's trying to put it all together and what our responsibility is as the recipients of God's grace. In Acts chapter 2, we have the first reference, you know, to the subject of fellowship. I want to read beginning with verse 41. So then, <clears throat> Peter was the preacher of that famous message on the day of Pentecost. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I want to read the rest of the passage, but I want to mention something, and I won't call attention to each one, but there are ten, ten imperfect verbs in the Greek in the verses that I'm reading to you now. Notice what I said, ten imperfect verbs. And those of you that have been applying yourself, and you know the importance of knowing something about the verbs and how they're used in the scriptures and the different tenses in the Greek and so forth. So let's read verse 42 again. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together. Were together. They had something in common. And folks, the student of the scriptures today, he can't have much in common with most of the things that he hears if, if, he is really a born-again Christian. And had all things in common. In common. Now that comes from the same Greek word that fellowship comes from. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. That's a holy communism, not an atheistic communism. As people are in need, Christians and people that come in contact with. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind. And what mind is it? Not what you think but it's the expression of God's mind, the mind of Christ, as Paul put it in his letter to the Philippians, which we have in our possession. So speaking the language of Scripture, not the language of religionist. And then he says, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people because they were of one mind. There was unity, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. Fruit of fellowship is our last message on the subject of fellowship. Fellowship is the result of experiencing the grace of God. And joy is the fruit of that fellowship. 
Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 John 1, verse 4. Let me read a passage to you. And these things we write, so that our joy may be made complete. May be made complete. That's a perfect passive participle. Which means to make full or to fill. 1 John 1 verse 4. Now the perfect tense means that having been filled with gladness, John and his comrades would continue in the state, in this state of fullness. Let me ask you a question before we go any further. Do you know the difference between <clears throat> the joy that God gives and the expression, your joy? Do you know the difference between God's joy and your joy? Now keep that in mind because we'll be looking at some scriptures on it in just a moment. But I wanted to raise the question so you'll start thinking with me and following as closely as possible. True joy, I said true joy, comes from doctrine, biblical doctrine understood and practiced. Let me say it again. We're going to be as practical as we can possibly be because it is so needed in this day in which we live. I said true joy comes from doctrine understood, from teaching of the scriptures that are understood, biblical doctrine, and the Bible is filled with great doctrine great doctrines and very few church members today and I can speak with authority on this because I've been around long enough, been a student of the scriptures long enough and have been writing long enough and I have seen very few people very few people who claim to be Christians that know enough doctrine to choke a gnat I'm just being plain with you. True joy comes from doctrine understood, but not only understood, but practiced. That means to put into practice what we learn. When doctrine enters the mind, watch this, when teaching of the scriptures enter the mind, it affects the heart of a Christian. I said it affects the heart of the Christian. And the heart is the emotional nature of the child of God. We're emotional persons. The individual is moved by what he has heard and understood. And following this, the Christian will is reached. His will is reached. And his willingness to do God's will supersedes everything else. And that and that alone produces real joy. Are you with me? That alone produces joy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Open your Bibles, please to a very familiar passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I want to read it, <clears throat> then we want to spend a little time really digging into it. Give you the outline of it anyway. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I'm reading from the NASB. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Fruit of the Spirit is what? Now we have nine things mentioned. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Folks, that takes in the whole Christian life. Takes in the whole Christian life. Against such... Now notice this. Against such things, there is no law. Now, do you know how to interpret that? You know what that really means? You know what Paul is really saying to the Galatians? If you have some understanding of Galatians, the six chapters of Galatians, and what really Paul was presenting to them and the reasons for it, then it's easily understood. I'll just give you a simple statement, and you can enlarge on it. When it says, against such things, there is no law. In other words, there is no such law against the fruits of the Spirit that are mentioned. That doesn't mean that you become an antinomian. Did you know most church members today are, regardless of the denomination, are antinomian? Keep that in mind. Very few who are not antinomian. Now, these nine graces, I call them, the grace of love, the grace of joy, etc., etc., these nine graces are separated into three divisions. I want to show you how simple the divisions are and then give you a brief meaning of each. Three divisions. Number one, the number one division. Love. Now that's agape love. There are two words used for love in the Greek language. The strongest of the two is agape. Agape love. And this is agape love. Love and then I put in your outline that you'll receive next week, in parentheses, bestowed by the Holy Spirit. This agape love is bestowed by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5, 5, when Paul made this statement, that his love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit of regeneration. It's the Holy Spirit that regenerates. The Word of God converts, but the Spirit alone, without any help from anybody, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life in regeneration. So love bestowed by the Holy Spirit, that's number one of the first division. Number two, joy. Love, joy is love exalting. Love exalting. Then number three is peace. And peace is love reposing. Love reposing. And all three of these are internal. Now keep that in mind. I want to show you the beauty of these graces. These are all internal. Internal. Something you experience. Love, joy, and peace. Now let's look at the second division. The second division, I'll mention them briefly, and then I'll do with each word what I did with the first division. Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Well, when you look at those three words, long-suffering, what is it? Love on trial. I said love on trial. Secondly, gentleness is love overflowing. That's gentleness, love overflowing. And thirdly, goodness. Goodness is love in action. Love in action. You know, there's a lot of talk about love today, but very few people really know what love is all about. Even human love. 
There is not much human love today. Did you know that? When I met Juanita almost six to three years ago, it was almost love at first sight. In five months, and in, in that period of five months to the day I met her, we married. Two months passed, I gave her an engagement ring. Three months passed, and I married her. And we've been married almost 63 years. Love. I think we both know something about love. Love at first sight. There isn't much love today. You know what makes me angry? When you see all of this mess today about making love, it's sexual perversion. Did you know that Condon, you know who I'm talking about? C-O-N-D-I-N? The Democrat from California? Did you know he's a Baptist? Bill Clinton, the pre former president, was a Baptist. Condon is a Baptist. In fact, his dad was a Baptist preacher. Folks, I have a number of documents on this that I won't get into. But all this talk about love today, it is a word used in the Greek. It is neither agape Our phileo, our phyllis, which means friend primarily, but eros, strictly of the flesh. That's all this world knows about love today. So what's the second division again? Long-suffering, love on trial. Gentleness, love overflowing. Goodness, love in action. And folks, these are not internal. These are external. I said external. When you have the grace of God, there will be a manifestation of that grace. Now so let's get, look at the third division. The third division, faith, meekness, and temperance. Faith, meekness, and temperance. Faith is love on the battlefield. You'll fight the good fight of faith. Secondly, meekness is love at school, S C H O O L, in the school of Christ. always ready to take your place and listen. You're ready to be taught. Love at school. Finally, and temperance, love under control. Whew. If that was ever needed, it's needed today. That kind of gives you a different picture, doesn't it? Now let's go back and read it, and then I'll just call attention to these things as we read it again. So, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. That's internal. Patience, kindness, goodness. That's external. And faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What is this? What is this? All are directed toward the Lord. Now, watch closely. When objective standards, objective standards, the Bible is my standard. That's the reason I can say without any reservation or hesitation. When a law is made by human government, 
making it legal to abort a child in the womb, that's murder. I don't make any bones about it. That's murder. By the way, having mentioned these documents that I have, I have a dozen documents, tremendous. Some of them are absolutely tremendous. I'd like to share much of the material with you. But that would take a long time to do. On stem cell research. Boy, you talk about curl your hair. I mean some of the greatest minds of our day. So when objective standards, the Word of God, are transmuted by grace into subjective experiences, the law approves of that conduct and gives no threat against such things there is no law of Galatians 5 and verse 23 the joy Christ gives differs from the fullness of joy now watch what I'm saying the Christian's joy is dependent on Christ if you don't have Christ you do not have joy You may have religion, but you don't have joy. And if you don't have joy, you're not saved. I'm talking about the joy that the Scriptures is describing. That the Word of God describes. So the Christian joy is dependent on Christ. Christ said these things, I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. This is John 15, 11, if you want to turn to it. So turn to John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you. He was speaking to his disciples. This was just before the great high priestly prayer of John 17. So he said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Now there's a difference between my joy and your joy. Look at it closely. I didn't just make up something. There it is. So let's look at it for a moment. The joy that Christ gives can never be interrupted by any circumstance of life. Now, I won't have to soak in before I go any further. And let me say it again. The joy that Christ gives can never be interrupted by any circumstance of life. I don't care what it is. I want to prove that to you, so turn to the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament, long to the latter part of the Old Testament. Habakkuk, I want to read a passage because it's so descriptive. I could never say what God says and in the manner in which he says says it. Whatever I'd say couldn't compare with it. Chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. Habakkuk suffered greatly. In fact, every man of God, every apostle, every prophet had their problems. And they suffered greatly for the cause of God. And here's what it says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, Though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in Him. 
I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he said. And he has made my feet like hinds feet. And makes me walk on my high places. In the quote. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. When you have a little problem, and it has to be little in comparison to what Habakkuk experienced. Do you whine and moan? I'm afraid most of us do too much. But nothing can take that joy away, and you know it. As a recipient of this joy, Christ's joy, you know what I'm talking about. So peace and joy Christ gives are the first fruits of justification. And cannot be altered. Notice what I said. It can't be altered. Now I want to explain something that is very practical. And I'm afraid that we act in such a manner sometimes that it reveals that we don't know as much about it as we should. So peace and joy that Christ gives are the fruits of justification and cannot be altered. Christ's joy is perpetual because he is immutable. The stream of joy can never run dry because the source, the fountain of Christian's joy, or Christ's joy, is infinite. Does that tell you something? Is that speaking to your heart? On the other hand, the saint's joy. Now watch this. The saint's joy may be affected because it is conditional. Your joy is conditional. If you know you should do something and you know what God's will is for you, but you do not do it, you're going to suffer, and your, your joy is going to suffer. You'll suffer. So, the saint's joy may be affected because it's conditional. It is conditioned on your obedience and being faithful to the Lord. Full and overflowing joy results from studying the scriptures and applying oneself to the written revelation of God. I've said from the pulpit to many of you that I have pastored for a great number of years that some of my greatest experiences and still remains true, some of my greatest experiences take place in my study alone with God, buried in the language, studying out something that I know is really important, and then seeing the truth of it. I'm affected by it, and what a fellowship it is. So, although the believer's gift of joy cannot be interrupted in the sense of being removed From a born again person, his joy may be interrupted by his own sin or sins. This is related to fellowship. That's why the subject of fellowship is so important. We're of the same mind, we share the same things, we have something in common. We're on the same wavelength. I don't have to talk to any individual. I don't care who it is. I can talk to him ten minutes and ask him a few questions, and I can tell whether we're on the same wavelength or not. And if I find I'm not on the same wavelength, I either shut up 
because I'm wasting my breath, because I'm speaking spiritual language, and I cannot expect one who is a stranger of the grace of God to understand, according to 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 14. So joy of fellowship may increase. This is what I've been desirous for in our little assembly. May increase with what? Increasing knowledge. And not only knowledge, but obedience. And not only obedience, but fruitfulness. So there are three things in that order. Knowledge, then being obedient to what we learn, and then, of course, fruitfulness. You want to know how important it is to be fruitful? Read the first 11 verses of John chapter 15 when you have time. Be well to put it down here as a reference as you're going over this later. However, my joy may decrease, and it will decrease because I become lax in study. I become disobedient to the known will of God. I knew what I should do, but I didn't do it, so you're paying for it. And thirdly, therefore, unfruitful. Unfruitful. The Christian enjoying his fellowship with the Lord will press on in his Christian life. Press on. The entrance in the fellowship is not the stopping place. It's not the stopping place, but the starting gate of the Christian race. And Paul presents the Christian race. And no one could express it any better than he did. He was under the inspiration of the Spirit in Philippians chapter 3. The whole third chapter ought to be studied at this particular point of your study of the outline when you get it. Christianity has the onward spirit. Onward, Christian soldiers. Onward. No sitting, no being still, onward, marching. We're in a race. And folks, I'm beginning to see the goal. At my age, I'm beginning to see the goal. I want to be faithful in my Christian race. But I'll tell you what. The only way I can be faithful is to stand for the things that God has taught me for 60 plus years. And I intend to be. I intend to be by God's grace faithful. I'm not going to let down or compromise on any little thing that might appear to be a very small thing that God has taught me. I'm not going to compromise it. Regardless of the consequences. I felt that way 60 years ago. How much more should I feel it today? Christianity has the own spirit. Progress is not made without discipline. Watch this. It is not made without discipline. The Christian life is a disciplined life. Progress is not made not only without discipline, it is made without struggle. It is not made without struggle. It's a struggle. It's not made without failures. I've failed in a lot of things. And so have you. Furthermore, it is not made without disappointments. I've been disappointed many times in many people. 
You know, when you have a few people that you preach to for 25 or 30 or 35 and some, I preached to some almost 40 years and find out that they've been wife abusers for many years. Oh, what a disappointment. Our pastor, and we believe in discipline very strongly and always have exercised discipline when we know it. But you can't exercise it when you do not know it. You know, you have a hard enough time. I've pastored a few large churches, a couple. But they won't stay large if you preach the whole counsel of God. I'll guarantee you that. These institutions today that brag about, for instance, like the, like the church in Korea, 750,000 members. How could they assemble together? 750. What about these that claim 20,000, 25 here in the States? They don't even know all the members, much less know what they're doing. And finally, progress is not without spiritual warfare. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6. One of the great Puritans of all time has written a tremendous volume of about eight or nine hundred pages just on that passage of Scripture, spiritual warfare, in Ephesians chapter 6. Following the death, let's use a biblical example now. Following the death of Moses, <clears throat> the Lord instructed Joshua to go on. Turn, if you will, to Joshua 1 and verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people. Now, I want to chase a rabbit for a minute while we're here on a phrase. So do you, do you all have this open? Are your Bibles open to this passage? All right, notice carefully now. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. Now, just stop there a minute. Do you know the difference between preaching and teaching? There is a difference. Teaching, you follow almost verse by verse go through. I like to do that. I've done a lot of it through the years. Preaching, you take a subject, but sometimes something happens or something comes to your mind and you realize that this should be said and folks, you'll find this in the Scriptures. If you'll follow Paul's writings, especially in the book of Romans, you'll find he'll be talking about some great biblical doctrine and all of a sudden, he starts chasing, not a rabbit, he knows what he's saying, and he knows why he's saying it. He's inspired by the Spirit at that time to do it. I'm not inspired by the Spirit in the same sense that Paul was inspired. I speak from an inspired book. I'm not inspired to write it. Follow me? But things need to be said once in a while, and you might be led to say something. Well, I want to say something here on this phrase. To the land which I am giving to them. To whom? To the sons of Israel. Do you know that... It, does Israel belong to the Arabs? Do you think it belongs to the Arabs? No. The Jews compromised even after they won the war of 1967. That land belongs to Israel. God gave it to them. Are you listening to me? Now, you're not going to hear much on the news. You notice how the news media stays away from this subject? I have about, I think it's 25 documents. 25 documents on Israel. 
And folks, some of them are absolutely tremendous that I've collected off of the Internet in just the last two weeks. And you haven't heard about these things. Did you notice Arafat last week kissing the Pope? You know what he's trying to do? You know what he's trying to do. So to the land which I am giving to them, God gave it to them. Now that doesn't mean that the Arabs may not take it. Did you know that Iraq has troops right now in this, right close to the Palestinians to aid them in war against Israel? You're not hearing anything about it. And I'll tell you something else. The government is making a mistake in Mr. Powell trying to bring peace. There will never be, there will never be peace between the Arabs and the Israelites. Any more than there was ever peace between Isaac and Ishmael. It goes back to Genesis chapter 17. Now let's, uh, having said that, Joshua led the children of Israel onward to cross the Jordan River, which was a major crisis of faith. Now watch this closely. We're going to cover some important ground right here. Their being brought out of Egypt was one thing when they left Egypt under the leadership of Moses. But the disobedient nation, the disobedient nation of Israel, bearing their self, burying their self-born aims and desires in Jordan was another. Was another. Jordan means death. That's the meaning of the word Jordan. means death. But this death, crossing over Jordan was for the Israelites instead instead of the Lamb's death on behalf on their behalf at the Passover now watch this if Israel had not been disobedient and wandered for many years in the wilderness that nation would have had no Jordan experience. Notice what God permitted for a reason. To teach Israel a lesson. She hasn't been fully taught yet. But she will be before Revelation chapter 7 is fulfilled. And I'll let you wonder about Revelation 7. We can't get into that part this morning. Although Jordan was a great attainment of faith. In the life of Israel, have you ever noticed this? If you haven't, listen closely. It was not recorded in Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter. This event was not recorded. Because Israel's disobedience kept it from being recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. So as the second generation of Jews or Israelites learn seemingly nothing from the first generation, how can we apply that to us today? We don't learn anything from the Christians before us. I want to make an application of that. Having been a student of the Puritans for many years, which began back in 1940, by the way, when you couldn't even buy books, Puritan books, couldn't buy them. They weren't published. I was able to get some from England and a used bookstore in England back in the early 40s. had some of the greatest theologians 
since Christ and the apostles. I said theologians. I could start naming them at least a dozen whose names would be familiar to you. But folks, look at England today. It's scary. When I see an English film on TV, you don't have to tell me it's an English film. I can tell you by the time it starts. The morals are horrible in America. But they're even worse in England. Some of the greatest theologians now look at England. And we are just a step behind. Just a step behind. Now, let's make it practical. Have you learned anything from the generations before you? Very little. Very little. We should learn something, but we don't. We have to learn it by bitter experience. And the Lord will see to it that we get that experience. Israel's wilderness journey had come to an end when they came to the Jordan River. And the time had arrived for them to possess their possessions. Why? Because God gave it to them. Their possessions. Possess your possessions. Folks, there are possessions already prepared for you and me that you and I have not as yet possessed. And you don't know what you're missing. Believe me, you do not know what you're missing. God wants His people to enter Canaan with their affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This necessitates self-judgment of all things that displease God. Self-judgment reveals that neither God's love for His own nor the prospect of Canaan has governed their lives as much as they desire. The way that God cleared Israel cleared for Israel to enter Canaan from Horeb in 11 days. Actually, they were just 11 days. In 11 days, they could have gone from Horeb to Canaan. But they wandered for 40, 40 years in the desert and paid for it. Well, does that apply to us? You see, I think God has a lesson in all the scriptures. I believe all the scriptures are written for our admonition, folks. When I hear people say, well, that was in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of illustrations. And if we'll look at them closely, we can see ourselves in those very experiences. Now I want to give you something to really think about. Romans, turn to Romans 5.5. For a moment. Let's make an application of what I'm talking about. Romans 5 5. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Let's read beginning with the first verse so we'll get the connection. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Watch it. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Are you willing to go through all those things to come to hope? Now notice verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's what happened when we were regenerated. 
We didn't even know anything about it. We didn't experience it. It just happened. The first thing, something has happened to me. I'm not the same. Believe me, folks, I know the difference between belonging to a church and being unregenerate and being regenerated and then become a member of the assembly. I've been there. You tell people that today, they don't know what you're talking about. I joined the church. That's it. They just joined they just joined the church. I was baptized. Yeah, you went down a dry center and came up a wet one. Still a center. Nothing happened. Nothing took place. That's what the churches are filled with today. Entertainment centers to get people to make a decision. You don't have to worry about people making a decision when the Lord has regenerated them. I can just ask any person four or five questions and tell you if I want to say any more to him or not. That's the scriptures, folks. That's knowing the mind of God. And what God has taught me, I'm certainly not going to turn against it. And I'll defend it, even to the point of death. Now, the love of God poured out in our hearts. Turn to the 8th chapter. The average Christian doesn't know what goes on between Romans 5.5. 5. And so I tried to word it in a way that you can see the illustration I'm using. With proper growth and development. I said proper growth and development. By Christians. The distance between Romans 5.5 5 and Romans 8 is short. That's a short distance. So you only have chapter 6 of Romans and chapter 7 of Romans. Are you willing to really study those two chapters? And then when you come to chapter 8, it's a great chapter. But there are a lot of things between Romans 5, 5, and Romans 8. But the average church member today likes to go from that to Romans 8. Let's read Romans 8. A little bit of it. Not all of it. 39 verses. We won't read all of it. But let's read a little bit of it. Because it's so wonderful. That's why we want to read it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, that's shouting ground. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And notice it says the likeness of sinful flesh. Not sinful flesh as all the peccability teachers are, in, are saying today. And they're heretics. All of them. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I drop down to verse 11. I just want to skip through it a little bit to show you something else, what they really like to read. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who indwells you. Drop down to verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now drop down to verse 28. Let's read several verses here. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Notice his purpose. For whom he foreknew. That's doctrine, folks. That's the foreknowledge of God. And foreordination of God. He also predestined. 
That means it's going to take place. It's not post-destined. Destined? Predestined. Predestined. To become conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, them He justified. Whom He justified, these He also glorified. You say, that's shouting ground. That's right. If you're a Christian. If you're really a Christian. Notice the next verse. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? I'm not worried about all the charges that have been brought against me. Or will ever be brought against me. I've outlived a lot of my enemies. But while I've outlived a lot of my enemies, I'm making new ones. Almost every day that you give your testimony or stand up for the truth of Scripture. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Now, that's great, but when you go back now, let me just give you an illust one illustration out of the 7th chapter. Turn to the chapter 7 and begin with verse 14. And folks, this verse of Scripture is talking about true Christians. Don't you ever forget it. All right, listen to it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. I want you to see what goes between the love of God being poured out in our hearts and standing before Him glorified. Alright? Verse 15. For that which I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever put yourself there? Do you do you know that experientially? Don't tell me you don't. I'll tell you you're a liar. I look you right in the eye and say you're a liar. All right, let's read a little further. Let's read all of verse 15 again. For that which I'm doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin dwelling in me. Folks, you still have the old sinful nature. And you have to fight him constantly, every day. Every day. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you do not have. And you're going to have that old sinful nature until the glorification of your body. As long as you're in time. Look at verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. He explains it. In my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish I do I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But I am doing the very thing I do not wish. I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I, joy, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Notice now verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then... On the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. 
Can you relate with chapter 7? Every Christian can relate with chapter 7. So Joshua led the children of Israel onward to cross the Jordan River, which was a major crisis. Israel's wilderness journey had come to a conclusion, and the time had arrived for the Israelites to possess their possessions. Self-judgment reveals that neither God's love for his own nor the prospect of Canaan has governed their lives as they did desire. The writer of Hebrews appealed to his readers to go on to Christian maturity. Turn, if you will, please, to Hebrews 6, verse 1. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Let's read the verse. Therefore, Paul said, leaving Leaving what? Leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. Let us press on to maturity. To maturity. Which means completeness of maturity of knowledge or practice. That's the meaning of the Greek word. Not laying again, he says, a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So having reproved his readers back in the 5th chapter, verses 11 through 14, the apostle went on to prescribe the remedy. I said the remedy for their lack of growth and experience. Now watch this. Maturity is not the same as perfection. You and I will never be perfect as long as we're here but we can become mature. We can become, and that should be our goal, fathers, as we've already studied in the second chapter of 1 John. But maturity is experience in time. Perfection will not be experienced until eternity, until you step out of time into eternity. So leaving the first elements of the teaching about Christ is not departure from the soundness of faith of the faith once delivered to the saints. It is leaving the first miles of the Christian journey and pressing forward to complete the journey. I've been in the race a pretty good while. I can see the goalpost. I can see the goalpost. Really? After all, 82, you're not going to live forever. I've already lived my life according to the way a lot of doctors term it. So, but you know, I haven't lived it all yet. You see, I'm not going to die until his time. There's a time to be born and a time to die. That's Ecclesiastes 3. I don't know the time, and you don't know it. Back about 16, 17 years ago, my health was pretty bad at that time. I wanted to kind of get things right for <clears throat> Juanita in shape. So you remember those days when I made some decisions. I thought we'd be able to get a pastor to take the church. And I was sincere in it. And I've been sincere two or three times. Here I am 17, nearly 18 years later. And still preaching and still teaching. It may end today. may end tomorrow. It may not end for five or six years yet. I'm not going until God's time. See, people look on age as three score and ten. 70. Well, I passed it. I passed it. So progress is divine knowledge. And experience is distinct from changeableness 
in doctrine. Pressing on to maturity is the remedy for lack of knowledge and experience. Many things are connected with Christ and his truth that are not communicated at the point of one's conversion. They must be progressively acquired. I said progressively acquired. Throughout the Christian's pilgrimage, great truths always come one by one. Folks, I'm a testimony to that in my life. I learned one great doctrine like God's justification and His sanctification and His impeccability and on and on divine election you mean I was chosen in Christ before the world began yes aren't you afraid of it not at all I've experienced it one by one and every time you learn a new doctrine God is going to put you to the test to see if you have really learned it mentally I've never learned a great biblical truth without having to experience it subsequently to the time that I learned it. So great truths come one by one. The two things alluded to in the statement, let us press on to maturity in Hebrews 6 verse 1, are progress and maturity. Paul expressed his desire to go forward in the Christian race. Turn with me to Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Philippians chapter 12. Uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, beginning with verse 12. Listen to this. <clears throat> Not that I have already attained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The possibility of failure to attain a particular goal should cause Christians to zealously pursue their course. The Christian race is one in which the child of God desires to know all he can learn about Jesus Christ in relation to time and eternity. That's why we spent some 35 messages on the subject of time and eternity and then had it published in a book. The present is not the principal state of Christians. Therefore the present should never be viewed separate from the future. From the future. The promise of the future is not the religious counterpart of secular fortune telling. God's promise to his people does not offer a secret to satisfy curiosity, but a message that penetrates to the heart of their existence. It compels us, folks. I said it compels us to look to the one who is our life. Turn to Colossians 3, 4. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Saints are numbered among the citizens of heaven. And I close with this thought. Citizens. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm just a pilgrim and stranger down here. 
Turn to Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Paul said, For our citizenship is a Greek word which means the commonwealth of heaven. Isn't that tremendous? For our citizenship, our commonwealth of heaven. So for our citizenship is in heaven, he said, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So the citizenship of heaven <clears throat> differs from the present citizenship of us all on earth. It even differs from Adam's citizenship of earth before the fall. So we have our responsibilities here. And I recognize what mine is. But there is treasure in heaven. My treasure is not here. It's in heaven. Whatever incompatibility <clears throat> there may be between simultaneous residence on earth and citizenship in heaven. Christians are admonished to put it out of the way. As strangers, we have no permanent dwelling here. However, as pilgrims, we have a permanent home there. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds, in other words, your course of life, glorify God in the day of visitation. The enjoyments of this world are uncertain and unsatisfying. I said, uncertain and unsatisfying. But enjoyment in heavenly citizenship is certain and satisfying. Christians eagerly await the coming of Jesus Christ. The Christian race will be completed. 1 John 3, 2. Look at it with me. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when He appears we shall be like Him because we shall see Him just as He is. The climax of Christian experience in time is the completion <clears throat> and consummation of Christ's humiliation and exaltation. <clears throat> Turn back now to Hebrews, or go to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. <clears throat> The last
last passage of Scripture, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, and this is how he concludes the 11th chapter, which is the Hall of Faith, the Hall of Fame, no, the Hall of Faith. And now in the 12th chapter, beginning with verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Folks, regardless of what we suffer or how we suffer, and believe me, Christians will suffer for the truth's sake. All who live godly in Christ Jesus, Paul said to Timothy, all who live godly will suffer persecution. But regardless of what we suffer, let us not forget the suffering of Christ who enables us to suffer. And then looking at this last statement again, who for the joy, talking about Christ, set before him, he knew what he was going to have to endure at Calvary because the Father had given us to him even before the foundation of the world. And he had to pay the price for our sins at Calvary. He knew what was before him. So who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down. Where is he now? Sitting at the right hand of the Father. But he's coming. Coming as King of kings and Lord of lords.